Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 146 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name is Barbara. How's it going, partner? It's going pretty good in a 32 degree Indiana. How are you, Barb? (laughs) Well, I finally took a couple days off, so I am home, hanging out, beautiful weather. It's a cool 65 in Florida. Gym. And uh, then I'm going to clean my house. Going to the gym. What do you do at the gym since you have a broken foot? Well, now yeah. I have to ride a freaking bike. Ugh. Stationary bike? Yes. All I can do. Oh, there's nothing worse than pedaling and not going anywhere. Yep. I'm still rehabbing my foot, wearing my brace, wearing it to sleep. And um, I go back next week to get an x-ray to see if it's better. And then he'll let me start walking. Woohoo. Ooh, wow. Congratulations. If all goes well, I can start running. So, but I super miss it. I bet. I joined a gym because I just can't do the sedentary lifestyle. I, it makes me crazy. So at least I'm getting out, working out, doing weights, looking forward to running again one day. I would kill for 65 degree weather to run in <laughs> right now. I bet you would. Last week I ran and it was 17 degrees. Ooh. And I'll tell you... That's a hard breathe. Yeah. It's hard to really do that. What the hell do you wear in 17 degrees running? Well, I, I have a whole face mask kind of thing. It's, well, it's actually in fashion now. But yeah. when I bought it a couple years ago, it was odd. But it's a whole head cover and then a winter hat over that. And I got a running vest and I wear tights. And wow. I do what I have to do because I got to run. I know. When it's too icy, I have to run on a treadmill, and I just can't do it. It drives me nuts. Understand. I guess 17 running is better than 65 and not running, so there you have it. You know what? You're right. You're right. I would take that. I would actually take that. (laughs) So I don't know if you saw the news. Lab Day Chicago 2021. It was supposed to be out in May. They've officially canceled it now. I know. Online only. Yeah, I was really looking forward to it. So as of now, all we have is the Texas meeting that's still happening in March. And they actually just had one in October. And then Visions 21 in Nashville is still planned for April 8th to the 10th. Good. And the FDLA down there in Florida, they announced their symposium is going to be June 10th to the 12th. Live, right? Live, as of now, yeah. All right. So we're still looking at March, April, and June. Super sad about Chicago. I mean, I understand that part of the experience and the greatness of Lab Day Chicago was just the size of it. Yep. Yeah, if you can't have the crowd and the vendors and all the other meetings that went with it, it's just not safe to do, and it's it's not worth it. It sucks. (laughs) So what's happening this week on our podcast? Well, this week we are joined by an absolutely... Great duo. Mm-hmm. Nice play on words. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It took me <laughs> days to think that up. <laughs> From Absolute Dental Services, we talked to co-owner Conrad Rensberg and the director of their signature prosthetic division, Jack Morano. You've probably seen these guys on social media doing videos or showing off their work, or maybe you saw them speaking live or at their 3D video at the Argon booth at last year's Lab Day. I mean, they are everywhere. So Conrad comes on to talk about coming to the U.S. and working at Absolute before purchasing it, building it up, and then teaming up with Jack to fill out all the different services that they wanted to do. They talk about meeting for the first time, how they train their team, scaling the work between four locations, getting into 3D printing, and also the importance of being a member of the dental lab community and giving back to an industry that has given them so much. So join us as we chat with Conrad Rensberg and Jack Morano. Hey, Barbara, have you heard about Oradent and their new partnership? You mean Up 3D, Elvis? Exactly. The new P5 milling machine by Up 3D. Is it another private label milling machine on the market? Actually, no. That's the cool thing. Up 3D actually manufactures their own mills. Wow, that's awesome. What is the P5 milling machine offering? Well, for starter, the P5 is a 5-axis 
efficient dry mill. All right, so that's super ideal and totally convenient, but what about the quality of the milling? Well, it boasts software that produces high precision and fast milling. It can mill a crown, get this, in 14 minutes. And the tool life yields about 60 to 80 hours of quality restorations. Wow, that must be super expensive software. Do tell. The cam nasting software is included at no additional cost. Come on. That's a super great cost savings for any lab. Budget friendly without compromising any of the performance. All right, so let's talk about price. Well, the funny thing is it retails for only $18,000. Wow, that's a super game changer for labs of all sizes, big and small. Under 20 k a small lab can now do their own milling instead of outsourcing. But don't forget the medium and larger labs can benefit big time from this too. The Up3D recently opened a home office in California near Oradent. So does that mean the mill ships from California and the remote technical support is also in California? Yes, Barbara, you are correct. Right. Obviously, as always, <laughs> they are both in the United States in Southern California. All you got to do is call our friends over at Oradent, 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit their website at Oradent.com. We appreciate your support of the podcast, Oradent. Thank you. Voices from the Bench, The Interview. We are excited to finally, after a few attempts, have two people on the podcast today. You guys are all over social media. You're all over Lab Day. I think everybody knows you, but you guys are from Absolute Dental Services. We got Conrad Rensberg and Jack Moreno. How are you guys? Doing great. How about you guys? I'm great. Doing fantastic. Doing great. So you guys are out of North Carolina, right? That's right. Yeah. So our main branch is in the Triangle area of North Carolina, close to uh, Chapel Hill, Durham area. And then we have a branch in the Triad, which is Greensboro. We have one in Wilmington, and then we have a branch in Charleston. So the southeast is kind of... Yeah, I had no idea you guys had four locations. That's pretty amazing. Mm. But I, I also want to mention that you were this year's NADL's Dental Lab of the Year. We were surprised and honored by it. Jack said, well, I don't know if we have a shot at this. There's so many great labs out there that do so many great things. But it was truly a great, I think, a, a great testimony to my team. You know, we have a, a really dedicated team of technicians and supporting staff here. And it's more about the whole team, not just making teeth. We have an Absolute Care Foundation, which is a nonprofit. So we give back to our community with outreach projects. We're doing Toys for Tots this year. Oh, right? yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, we did a house project. If you ever want to check it out, it's absolutecares.org. So when we got that, I think it, it really gave my team what they deserved. And that's being more than just a dental lab, you know, being more than just making teeth, but also giving back to your, your society and the yeah. way we live. Well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, giving back is that extra step. Yeah. So Conrad, you don't sound like you're from North Carolina. <laughs> I didn't use Where... my North Carolina twang enough yeah. there. No, no, I, uh, I don't hear it. Yeah. So where are you from and how'd you end up in this industry? I'm originally from uh, South Africa, grew up there, went to Pretoria Tech in 88. We still had a four-year baccalaureate degree in technology. Wow. It was great because you get to experience all the facets. You know, we went from oral anatomy to dental materials to business administration. So it was a really comprehensive training program, which was, you know, looking back, I appreciate it. But being a student and sitting there for four years was tough. I bet. You know, things kind of changed in Africa in the 90s and 2000s. And I got a job offer in North Carolina. I actually got an email one day and it said, are you interested in relocating to NC? And I went to my dad. I'm like, where the hell is NC? (laughs) (laughs) What is NC? And he's like, well, it's either some South American country we've never heard of or it's probably North Carolina. So (laughs) Three days later, got on a plane, flew over, got the job offer, and I came to the States July 4th, 1999. And I'd never forget, I I got off the airplane, and there was somebody standing, handing out little American flags. 
I'm yeah. like, I like this country. Everybody that comes to this country gets an American flag. I'm like, damn, yeah, you know, that's, that's some pride right there. And then somebody told me a few months later, you know, it's July 4th, you idiots. You know, ah. <laughs> Were you worried about all the explosions in the air that night? Or? <laughs> hey, I was from Africa, man. I'm mean, used to that kind of stuff. <laughs> so was your dad in the industry or how did you go? To, how did you even look into the school for it? We uh, actually had some friends, uh, Eddie and Benny von Schlifting. They own a lab in Virginia right now. I think it's called Synergy Lab. Yeah. And they were a few years ahead of me. And I just heard about it. And somebody said, dental technicians make a lot of money and work short hours. So I'm like, yeah, be better than that. <laughs> Ended yeah. up we work long hours and don't make a lot of money. But it was nice. <laughs> But it was an interesting journey for me. I'll uh, give you this and then I'll give Jack a minute. Yeah. I came to the States in 99, started working for Absolute and managed the lab. My business partner and I, Drew Van Arder, purchased the lab in 04. And in 07, I was diagnosed with stage three colorectal cancer. Oh, mm. no. One of those really, not sure if I can say the word, oh, shit moment. You can probably leave that. No, up. please but say it. It really was. Uh, yeah. Know, kind of a life-changing event for me. And I realized afterwards, you know, we, we came to the States with nothing, literally a box and a suitcase. And we got so focused on the prize, you know, being successful, being respected, mm-hmm. all that, kind of forget about life. And that's where our care foundation was born from, you know, realizing that, you know, we're not just here to make teeth, but we're here to leave a legacy. You know, and through my journey, I I realized one day, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be, sorry about that. It's all good. Emergency patient in the chair. (laughs) (laughs) Don't crack it. Stop everything you're doing. Life's about to end. So good. Um, Life in the lab. I love it. Life in the lab. Yep. Dr. Soso is on the line. He's very upset. Um, So, you know, it was kind of a moment for us. And we realized that our focus became so focused on the mighty dollar we forgot you know you only have one life to live yeah and it spawned our care foundation and the care foundation you know we did a first project we did a extreme home makeover the whole lab was involved went in on a friday redid the whole house my whole team was there it was it was really it was a cool event to see and bring the lab together in in outside the lab you let Mm -hmm. dental technicians do housework i mean well we had one qualified supervisor uh, was standing. I was going to say those technicians would stick on just one part and constantly work on it until it was perfect. Everybody yeah. was arguing about if the tiles were straight and if the contact <laughs> were closed, you know, everybody sees it differently. So that was yeah. kind of our story. But, uh, you know, Jack joined us about three years ago. Three years ago, yeah. And yeah. this is the last thing I want to say before I give Jack a chance. You know, uh, my business partner, myself, you know, I've always been more the the business part of things, and he's always been the pure technician. You know, loves occlusion, function, protrusive, you know, all the shades. And I was just like, you know, how much do we get paid for that? Yeah. Yeah. When Jack joined us, he really became that third arm that we've always looked for. And that was that true prostodontic view of things. Mm-hmm. So it's been um, since Jack joined us. And Jack is also the reason that we actually went into the social media platform so heavily. And you know, I can't thank Jack enough. You know, first night I met Jack, we we had, I think we stopped counting at three bottles of wine. Yeah, it was it was a case of wine. Uh, All right. <laughs> and you know, when you oh, meet, you my meet, language now, gentlemen. And there uh, might have been a few cigars in there. And, yeah. and I think yeah, when I met Jack, you know, when you meet people and it feels like you've known them forever. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of been Jack and our journey. It's been been like that. Great friends. I have so much uh-huh. respect for Jack. I will say, you know. 25 years doing this, Jack's probably the most highly talented technician both my business partner and I have ever worked. Wow. It's been a great journey, especially the last three years or so with you. So with that, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, stay. you got a lot to live up to here, Jack. Yeah, no, no, uh, no, that's no, quite the introduction. I'm completely embarrassed. And, and I'm also <laughs> sliding Connor at a $100 bill but, over here. You guys. Yeah. <laughs> but real quick, I will say that to now know that you guys have only been doing this for three years, it seems like you've been doing it forever. Yeah. You can tell that connection you guys have when you're on screen and social media and what you did at Lab Day and that 3D presentation. You know, it's it's one of those crazy things in life that was just meant to be. I don't want to sound corny and cheesy, uh, but it kind of was. And that first night we got together, said, hey, let's have a, you know, a drink. And, and Conrad said, yeah, let's have a drink. 
Uh, so, so let me set the stage just here. So, <laughs> so yeah, Jack was working f- with Lee Culp at that stage, and yeah, we, that's what I thought. And okay. we're we're competing head to head, and you know, I don't think uh, Leo or I will ever have a Christmas turkey together. Yeah, so I get this LinkedIn message from Jack Morano from Sculpture Studios who wants to reach out to me and come and talk to me. So now, really, I thought, whoa, spy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I took all the case bands off the walls and yeah. blah, 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 blah. So yeah, we started from literally from nothing, but it was such a good, good uh, yeah. time to go. Yeah, I mean that that first night we just hit it off, and it was it was like we knew each other for years, and and our vision aligned our thoughts and our theories and our beliefs and everything about business and dental technology and where it's going was right spot on. It's it's the same thing with Dries. Uh, Conrad's business partner, we all see eye to eye. Since that day, it's been nothing but nonstop. And And I think very complimentary. I think, you know, a lot of technicians, including myself, and especially my business partner, are very focused on doing everything themselves. Because if you're a true artist like Jack and Dries, it's like, just give it to me, let me finish it. Instead of saying, let me teach you how to do this. So when Jack joined us, I said, Jack, if we want to be successful, you have to be able to scale this. And I think you guys will definitely agree with me on this. The hardest thing for dental technology has always been scalability. Yep. You, know, you have one technician can only wax 10 copings. Now that we have CAD CAM and all these other processes, it's much better. But I And I hope Jack agrees. But that was my goal with Jack is to teach him replicate your hands and my compliment to you you have done an exceptional job with that yeah it's you know it's one of the hardest things and i've been teaching technicians and giving courses and lectures you know for for a while and and you mm-hmm. know first i'd like to say before anything else that i've just been very blessed and, and thankful for the career i've been able to have mm-hmm. that's first and foremost and, and so important to me and when i'm doing education or you know, training, I'm always trying to give back to the technicians because, you know, I, I really love the industry and I love technicians. And one thing I haven't been able to do out of all the things that I've accomplished amongst all the failures, I tell everybody and everybody cracks up laughing because uh, I've failed just as much as I've been successful, which is kind of funny, but it was scaling is something that I've never been able to accomplish, basically make more jacks. And yeah. uh, Conrad's like, trust me, this will work. And, and, you know, of course that's one thing I'm like, yeah, I don't know, but he said, just trust me. And, um, it worked. It really, really did. And I'm, you know, I was talking with Dries just, you know, this weekend in QC in the out room right now is my career about, you know, 20 years in is really at its peak of everything I've been working towards. And a lot of that has to do with Mm -hmm. Dries and Conrad in this relationship we have, we each have our talents that we bring and we do, you know, complement each other to where we're at today, where I could stand back. And I told Dries in that room this week, I said, I can't believe it. It's finally come to pass. And, and a lot of that is scalability. A lot of it is full contour. I mean, I started full contour, the belief in full contour way before anything digital. I mean, still back in the Empress days. Oh yeah. And um, I look at today where I was, where I went, and where I am now. And it's just remarkable. And I could honestly say today, you know, standing back and looking at everything, it really is just, it's it just works. And I think, you know, as business owners and dental technicians and whatever we want to call ourselves, it's important to realize, I think, that our industry has shifted. Think about this, LMT three years ago, it was talking about, do we go digital? Two years ago, it was like, we really need to be digital. This year it was, if you're not digital, and you're at, yep. yeah, that digital shift has been so exponential. You know, it's just technology. Technology shifts exponentially. Once people, the adoption rate is there, you start seeing the shift. And we've seen it. We were talking yesterday in our executive leadership group, and I said to my team, how's our job search going or our job hunt? We're, we're obviously always looking for CAD designers, especially CAD designers. And they're like, well, yeah. it's tough. I said, think about this. What we're looking for now doesn't exist. We have to create those positions because how many people are CAD designers? It's all people that basically taught themselves how to work with the software. Mm-hmm. So our focus, I think, at Absolute is training you know, and keep on training. We have two computer guys, Rick and Louis, who yeah. always 
make fun of them because there's nothing Rick and Louis can't do. And I said, those are the kind of guys that will be ultimately the future of dental labs. Mm -hmm. If you think about, say, five years ago, you said that ceramists would not be the alpha and omega position in a dental lab. <laughs> People would have told you you're crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, <laughs> we have how many ceramists? Three. Yeah. You know, true ceramists, because yeah. this layering is just, you know, and it, it's all different. All labs are different. But I do think, you know, we have to evolve with this. And compliments to Jack. I think you've done that very well, creating the absolute art team, making sure that we can take care of the prosthodontic customers. Yeah. So that's been, a, it's been an interesting. My yeah. question to Jack is, how do you make more Jacks? How do you scale up? How, how has that happened for you? What does that look like? You want to know what? It was... Whips and chains. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, yeah I, Talk I, in I, my language again. Come I, on. That's a different <laughs> podcast there. <laughs> Is uh, this still a rated PG podcast? No. Not so, now. Uh, you still have that pink whip with the uh, golden. <laughs> yeah. That's the, <laughs> no, you know what? It's it's kind of funny. And I don't think if you would have asked me, I think a, a lot of it was Conrad's guidance and ideas. A lot of it was Dries and Conrad's willingness to give me the help. Come in here and do Jack. Yeah. I didn't have any restrictions. You know, start an art team, do what you do, teach them what you want to teach them and basically trust know, them. Yeah. And and that had a lot to do with it. That had a lot to do with it because I've done a lot of consulting too. And a lot of time I go into labs and, you know, I'm kind of like the foreigner when I step in there. And, yeah, yeah. You know, whether they adopt or they don't adopt what I talk about when I'm there, but here it wasn't that way. And a lot of what I teach or a lot of what I do, you know, you walk in the lab and all labs are the same, but all labs are different at the same time. Yeah. And something I'm talking about or doing might absolutely look absurd, but again, credit to them. They said, let it be and let's mm -hmm. see what happens. Let me tell you from the sidelines. So we have a, our master ceramist is Yansu Kim and probably one of the most talented ceramic artists I think I've ever, yeah. ever worked with. And he was responsible for a lot of the bigger cases that Absolute showed before, mm -hmm. before the Jack era. So when Jack came in, Yansu obviously felt a little threatened because, you know, here's this big name technician all of a sudden, what's going to happen to Yansu? And he was holding on to layering ceramics. We did a lot of cobalt chrome full arch cases, you know, do the mm -hmm. cobalt chrome mold frame and then layer ceramics. And that was his calling card. And Jack gave him a few zirconia hybrids and he kicked up against it a little bit and jack said just give it to me i'll finish it and he finished it and yan su looked at the the work and he was like man this is really good i'll tell you today if you put a cobalt chrome frame in front of yan su <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah he runs the other way he's but like I, hell no i'm not working on I'm that. Not doing that give it to somebody else but yeah. i think it's through example yeah and, and you know that's kudos to you you know the quality of product that you produced made our technicians go we want to be better yeah mm -hmm. that's, and, that's, and, and you know what, with the, with the technicians work. it's each one is a technicians are their own the best way i ever heard it put was kim bradshaw back in micro dental days she was ceo she called technicians creative hmm. that absolutely defines it 100 yeah. percent. and each one of them is different and when when i'm working with them when we're talking about scaling you know first and foremost you got to get buy-in they got to believe in it and then it's a lot of it's a lot of training there's a lot of pain suffering that comes along with it lots of failure but where we're at today you know like i said with my whole career the first time i seen empress i seen i thought it was the most incredible thing ever and the reason why is because it was full contour yeah forward all of these years and and barb you know and, and elvis and i've been talking on and preaching and lecturing on full contour for as, as long yeah. as i remember now i can sit back and say with the materials we have at hand with the software and technology the hardware the software we have at hand you know the supporting materials it truly has arrived and it's made my job <clears throat> in training so so much easier let's take a product like mio let's look at gingival ceramics gingival ceramics i spent a good half of my career trying to perfect and it wasn't as prevalent as it is today back then it was kind of a very niche for a ceramist mm -hmm. but there were ceramists that did it brilliantly yeah. and then there was everybody else and the ceramists that did it brilliantly definitely did not teach it no it, it, there wasn't gingival ceramics class nope. you could attend. But it was, <laughs> I always looked at Willie Gallagher. Yeah. Wow. 
you would go on a Willie Gala course. There's no way you can come back and do that. Yeah, yeah. Even <laughs> if, even if well, you I taught, couldn't. nobody. Just, yeah, nobody can do it. Let me it rephrase. Me, I couldn't. Yeah, it took me years to perfect that. I it was something that I couldn't pass on or couldn't oh, teach. Okay. Now we look at a product like Mio Gingival, Mio Pink. And I can teach it and they get it and it's mm. it's quick and it's fast as far as the eureka moment in the technician's head I and mean, how quick they're able to grasp the technique mm -hmm. has advanced. It's at yeah. light speed now. So mm. I could sit down and show somebody and by the time I spend a couple hours with them, you can't tell the difference or have trouble telling the difference between mine and theirs. And that's wow. where we're at today. And that's what I get really excited about. And again, it's, it's, this is a lot of what I've been able to accomplish recently is a lot of what I've always strived for over the mm. years and, and haven't. So it's pretty exciting time. And I think now, you know, people always say, well, you know, it's technology. And I think technicians in general push back against technology because they yeah. think it will make them obsolete. Yep. Me, right. technology gives us perfection because where I always struggled as a ceramist was I got to, I got to build a full arch case. I got to build every line angle every incisal edge position, the midline, all those things. It took hours to do the first, second bait. Oh, yeah. That's just the structure. I worked with Lyndon Cooper at UNC early on in 2000, 2001. And he called me one day. He said, I want to talk to you before we continue our relationship. He said, you know what the difference is between a great technician and an exceptional technician? It's the last five minutes of contouring. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Think about yeah. It. yeah. yeah. <laughs> think about it. That's where the difference comes in. You know, yeah. that can roll a line angle just another quarter millimeter more that makes it look perfect. And I think what we've noticed, and I think kudos to Jack in his art team teachings, is save the hands for the artistry. Let the machines do the stuff that doesn't really matter or you don't really see. So I think our industry is in an extremely good place. You know, we're heavily involved with carbon printed Lucitone dentures. And Jack spoke at CalLab two years ago. Yeah, I think yeah. it was two years ago. That was a great one because that was on 3D printing and I was on the panel discussion. And I think, I don't know, Barb, I'm sure you yeah. were there. My first slide was like, printing is the future. And my next slide was, don't buy a printer. And I'll never forget <laughs> for the rest of my life. That night, I was up at Big Bar and... and and I forget the gentleman's name, but I could pick him out in a crowd because I remember his face. And he said, thank you so much. You saved me $100,000. <laughs> and then fast forward. But yeah, I didn't get a cut. I should have got like, I don't know, 10%. <laughs> fast, <laughs> you just be glad the manufacturers didn't yeah. kill you. Oh, I know. Yeah. Fast forward six months, oh. a year. And now we see the greatest material coming out of printer. So, ever in dental history. You know, yep. I actually helped Jack with that presentation for CalLab. You know, we looked at ROI on machines. We looked at everything that, why would you buy a printer? Why not just you know, outsource to Arjun? Because in those days, we were printing, yeah. Arjun were printing all our models. <laughs> and we had Brian Almeida from Carbon. He was in the lab 20 times. He said, man, you're a KOL. Other labs, listen to what you have to say. We need you to buy a Carbon. And I'm like, Brian, I will never buy a Carbon. I will not pay thirty or forty thousand dollars a year to print models. It just doesn't make any sense. There's no ROI in it. And he called me. Was it June, June, yeah. July? And uh, said, I want you to come down to to Charlotte. Long story. I want to show you the new Lucitone digital print denture. And I was like, Printed dentures? Have you seen the stuff on Facebook? Yeah. I said Brian, I will never print dentures in my life. Went down there. I sat down and they sent the first denture around, and they specifically said no pictures. I obviously took pictures because you don't tell a technician you can't. Yeah. yeah. I snapped a picture of one of the dentures. I sent it to Murana. I said, I'm buying two carbon printers. We're printing dentures. <laughs> and you that know, was that. and if you look at it, and that's technology, you know, that's how technology makes us look like fools. If you're not open enough to go into something with an open mind and have the criteria preset of what I'm looking for, strength, aesthetics, you know, ROI, all those things, then technology will pass you by. Yeah. I mean, we did a meeting the other night and Jack said, I can't believe it, but Conrad and, and myself are standing on stage and we're not just talking about dentures, we're excited about dentures. Yeah. So it's been a wild ride for us the last five years and it's going to get better and, and more fun, I think. So you weren't printing any dentures before and then you went all in on the carbon lucitone partnership? Yeah. Yeah. We always compared printed dentures to hand processed and, you know, yeah. 
great technicians, Richard Cryer. I mean, you name it. These guys are oh, sure, are yeah, fathers of of removable dentistry. So, so don't don't get us wrong. We don't by any means think we're removable technicians. We have Chris Love, which yeah. is a great <laughs> upcoming technician. We just nominated him for the top forty under forty. Mm just because he had to re-engineer everything we were doing. But we looked at this and said, if we're going to be able to print a denture, because for us, it's about the product we produce first and foremost, not about the ROI. That, yeah, that's yeah. a secondary consideration. But we looked at it and said, if we pop a denture out of a printer, we put teeth in it, and we put it next to a hand-processed denture, it should be at least the same or better. Yeah. And could never get to that point until the Lucy Tone Carbon Partnership. So yeah. I'll tell you, in 25 years, I don't think I've ever seen a product with the potential of that. Hmm. You're not going to buy one of these printers, stick it in, and you're just going to switch everybody. Adoption rate amongst our clinicians was tough in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of clinicians had bad experiences with digital dangers. They were glass-like. They fracture easy, those kind of things. And kudos to Chris. You know, mm-hmm. He really explained the value and I'll tell you, when you look at just the return on your investment on a carbon printer, it's probably the cheapest printer out there because you can print I've almost that. 60 denture bases in a day. And I don't yeah. want to sound like a carbon. Well, once you I'm got, just, you know, now you have an actual product yeah. that you can sell. You're making money profit. with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So where before it was a model, that's not a giant revenue producer. Ooh. So it, it didn't really make sense. So you could print models on anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now they got actually a restorative material, yeah. and that's where if night you look guards. at, well, yeah, the night guards are unbelievable. We haven't handmade a night guard in six months. Yeah, yeah. Nice. He's still splint, right? He's, he's yeah, splint, these yeah. things are crystal clear. The fit, the accuracy on them is amazing, mm. and that's where we're at. And you look how fast it's coming now. Yeah, it's the same thing. I've been, you know, early adopter, early pioneer <laughs> of the technology of the materials. Done a ton of research and development. If you look at even in the the zirconia field, mm. how much I just finished up or am finishing up the Argin HT Plus multi layer, and you got everybody else is coming out with that next high strength, high translucency layered zirconia, and that's for us as technicians, as laboratory owners, as managers, the most exciting time because now you get this you know competition going within manufacturing and research that really really drives it home. I mean. We reap all the benefits. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do. I just finished up 15 of them and they were all multi-layer zirconia. And I'm like, I would like to do this all day, every day yep. And, yep. Not, and not layer because it's absolutely beautiful. It's translucent. It looks amazing and it's easy. Yep. It's easy. If they're going to last. <laughs> There's so many reasons why it just makes sense. And, 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 and this, you know, aesthetically we're with multi-layer zirconia, you know, even the Argent HT, aesthetically is as good as any yeah. any layered yeah. crown we've ever seen and yeah. Yeah. You know, i've always said you know the one word in our industry that's highly abused and overused is a high-end lab i'm a mm-hmm. high-end lab you know how do you define a high-end lab one guy working for one clinician or yeah. a guy that can publish cases that look spectacular you know there really is no true definition to me the definition of a high-end lab is a consistent lab consistent mm-hmm. products Agree. I was talking to one of my clinicians one day, and he said, you know what I enjoy about Absolute? I know what I get. Yeah. I know what Crown takes this. And don't we make mistakes too, like everybody else does. He said, but I can generally tell you this is how long a Crown's going to take. He said, I worked with the guy one day. One Crown would go in in five minutes, one take 35 minutes. He said, yeah. I can't book that on my schedule. So yeah. for us, I think consistency is the true sellable asset you know if you can be consistent then people know what they can expect and they can set their schedules around it so i think you know technology is really helping us to be more consistent don't you think Jack? yeah absolutely that consistency is harder to get the bigger and bigger you get it is you know the more employees you add you guys have four locations it's got to be hard to keep that consistency it's such a good point you bring up and you know what that is and that's probably absolute strength and its weakness is that my business partner, Jack, and my general manager, Tracy Jesse, with Dave, are the only people who do QC. There you go. So the problem with that is, let me put it this way, we have an internal remake rate of about, what, 45, 50% that goes back. Yeah, it's internal, 45%? Open contacts, shades off a little bit, not fully. I'm just talking adjustment rate. We used to have this sign-up in the lab 
that showed the internal remakes or internal adjustments. And it was, uh-huh. you know, 58%. And uh, one of the patients walked in and she saw it. And she called her dentist. She's like, do you know these people have a remake rate of 60%? That's not very good. <laughs> but if you look yeah. at our external remake rate cases that come back, it's less than 1%. Well, yeah. yeah. Because we stop it internally. Your problem with that is it's extremely tough to do it because we got to look at how many cases every day, send it back, get it back, get it back in the process. But I think once you're able to control your QC, you've got to have a guy that sees black and white. And my business partner is black and white. The contact's open or it's not open. It's Mm -hmm. not kind of open. It's open. Yeah. So I've got a question about your four locations. So do you specialize in, in different uh, manufacturing, different devices in, in different locations, or do you do the same at all four locations? So really good question. What we realized early on is if you're not local, you're basically, it's hard to establish relationships with customers. You know, it's easy to go into an area and say, I can do a crown for 50 bucks. You know, they're going to try you. If it's reasonable, they might send you a case. Because we're not competing on price, our crowns are considerably more expensive than that. You have to have the relationship to back that that up, mm-hmm. you know, or they won't use you for long. So we went into strategic partnerships. So we don't really have locations as much as we have partnerships. We opened uh, Wilmington originally with a friend of mine. Now we have Dave Hartman that runs that. And Dave is basically a branch executive. He's a lab owner. So I believe a lab is about one thing, the man who answers the phone. I don't care Mm -hmm. who owns the lab. It's the guy who answers the phone that builds the relationships. Mm -hmm. So for me, and inside Absolute, we don't have any egos. And that's why I get along with Jack so well. I can tell Jack what I think and what I don't think. And he can do the same for me and my business partner and my general manager. So having these branch executives in Wilmington and the Triad, and it's their company, they make the operational decisions. Mm. We determine the quality, the standard. So most of the technology is in the triangle, but those guys have the ability to do custom stainings, mill and scan, and those kind of things. Our Charleston branch was a little bit different. We identified the Duncan brothers, Brad and Roy, and we brought them into the fold. So they became part of the absolute family. I'm not a big fan of buying labs. I think when you purchase a lab, you disenfranchise the lab owner. Mm-hmm. Because you already got paid and you need that guy on the front line. Mm-hmm. So yeah. our expansion has always been more, if you see things the way we see it, you're a high quality technician, but you're tired of dealing with the business administration, the HR issues, filing the taxes, getting all of this. We take all that off the table. We leave some equity in it for you, but you become and you work under the absolute brand. And that's been a great business model for us because we keep our people engaged. Yeah. And he's working for something towards his retirement. You know, one day yeah. when, when he retires, he's built an asset as well. So that's been a good business model for us. That's important to keep that local connection, especially with labs. But that Charleston, that's got to be kind of out of the area for you guys, isn't it? I mean, is it a little bit farther away than the other ones? It's, yeah, it's four hours away. Yeah, but I think hours. the fact that Brad and Roy are basically the lab owners, they working on the, the absolute brand, you know, that takes the responsibility from us having to drive back and forth to go, you know, to go service our customer. Sure. I think as long as you can have somebody with skin in the game. Oh yeah. That's where partnerships become troublesome sometimes is, you know, you, you don't, you you don't really have somebody that cares enough and you know, our industry, you're only as good as the last crown you put out the door. (laughs) Yeah, 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 for sure. So do you guys do the designs for all of your laboratories in one location or do you, Jack, do you go to the different locations and train? I go to a lot of the different locations and train. One of the things that makes all this work, and I've talked about this before, and, you know, sometimes I I call it the dirty word. You know, when we're talking about technicians, they like to think of themselves as artists. So a couple of things (laughs) you can't mention when you talk to technicians is money, um, making money in business. But I would love for more of them to start ad- adopting some of these ideas when we're talking about branding, like you were talking about, how do you get the consistency when you're talking about multiple <laughs> locations? If you look at business, I've never been a big Starbucks guy. I'll, you know, I love coffee, but it's just never been my thing. But for example, if I have Starbucks in Raleigh and then I go to Charleston and have Starbucks, 
And then if I get on a plane and fly to Tokyo and I get a Starbucks, it's all exactly the same. Yeah. Every single one of them. And that's super, super, super important. So when we're working with the locations, first you have to determine and define your brand. I do, of course, a lot of full arch, full mouth, complete rehabs. What does that look like when you send a case or let's call it an order to Absolute and it's a complete rehab, whether it's to the Charleston location, the Wilmington location or to Durham? What does that mean? And there's there's so many different things from by the time you get to the end, of course, the final product and that I can control through training. You got to mm -hmm. define what the standard is for that final product, but also a, a huge part of it. You don't want to know what out of every hybrid restoration I sell, I would probably say 25% of that is hybrid and 75% of that is service that I sold. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. nice. it, it really, really is. It's the service that I'm selling and not so much the restoration. The yeah. restoration is a byproduct <clears throat> of the great service. Yep. And mm -hmm. you know, Jack very well said, I think, you know, I have a, a lot of friends in larger corporations and they all all CEOs I've ever talked to have said, remember, we don't sell a chicken biscuit, we don't sell a tooth, we don't sell this, we sell a service, we sell an experience. Mm -hmm. And it really is true if you think about it. You know, I have a friend, there's a restaurant in town he likes to go to. And this restaurant's pretty good, it's not much better than anything else. But he only goes there because when he walks in they know his name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The yep. only reason he goes there, and that's the only reason he thinks they're the best. So what we do is we've never tiered our technicians. We have an anterior team. We have a art team who does the big cases. So if you send a case to Absolute, it depends on what type of case it is, not who it came from. So if mm -hmm. we work with student clinics at MUSC or student clinics at UNC, and it's an anterior case, they get Jack Morano, and they get Jack Morano and his team. And I think that's a, a good way... Jack of all trades, master of none. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended there, Jack. But if you have special teams, like we have a team, all they process is posteriors, stand yeah. and glaze contouring. Then we have mm -hmm. Jack's team. We have a removals team. You know, so I think that's been a successful business model. So if somebody in Charleston, for argument, say, sends in a, a big hybrid case, they send it to Jack, he processes but they're all operational facilities. We just try to maintain that uniform standard. Yeah, I get it. I like the fact that you have the teams doing each individualized process and crown and bridge. I mean, I, I don't think there's any other way at this point where you can keep that consistency. Sure. As a lab gets bigger, you know it as well, Bob, it's, you know, it gets out of hand very quickly. And that's where leadership and having the right managers and allowing these people to make mistakes. I think that's the hardest thing that I had to learn as a businessman is you got to allow people to make mistakes mm -hmm. and you can't crucify them every time they make a mistake because that's how we learn. You know, that's how we get yep. better is by making mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes they have to make the mistake or they won't yep. learn it. <laughs> you got to allow them to make that yeah. mistake. You know? These technicians like to grab the case out of their hand and say, let me just finish it for you. But, you know, yeah. we'll never get there. And I think that's what Jack has done well is say, no, go back and go fix it. This mm -hmm. is not what we're looking for. So yeah. a very interesting industry we are in. For sure. So what are you guys looking to do next? You guys are, like I said, all over social media. And I see that you have an upcoming IDS coming out. And what's next for Absolute? It's a good question. Man. <laughs> actually, that one actually got it. Yeah, I think. Uh, Let us know you, when you know. No, I'm just kidding. You didn't send us that question beforehand. <laughs> I think it's managing technology. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that our future is printing. Mm -hmm. You know and that this is a very early statement. But if I was in the supply industry, my focus would be printable materials. Because yeah. if you think about it, if you print something, you can print to 20 microns, 30 microns. When you mill something, you have the wear on the mill. You've got, oh, yeah. the, uh, you've got stuff breaking. So milling, mill milling for us has been perfected. I think we're finally at a place where milling is as good as it's going to get. Yeah. I don't think you can physically mill any better. So I think the future for our industry is definitely in the printing industry. Yeah, right? watch, watch for materials so, and watch printing materials because mm -hmm. right now it doesn't exist today at the speed we're moving. Yeah. Tomorrow it does. Yeah. And yeah. It's revolutionary. Yeah. And you got to keep up. And, you know, if we define our industry, when I started in the mid-90s, 
the separation or the distinction between labs were who can really layer a crown and make it look spectacular mm -hmm. because it was yeah. tough to do. I mean, yeah. you, you guys know as well as I do, you know, I layer a crown next to my business partner. Mine doesn't look like a tooth. He's actually dead. But that was a distinction in dental labs. Going forward, I think that, and I'm not, I'm, please hear my heart. I know artistry is the most important part of what we, what yeah. we do. But a lab will be successful going forward with the products and the support they offer to their customers. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to say, I'm a full service lab. I don't think a full service lab means anything today. You have to be a full solutions lab. Mm -hmm. If you can give, and that's why we're in guided surgery. We do the guided conversions and that's why we got into dentures eventually. And that's why we have Jack Morano's art team because you've got to be able to give a clinician a solution for every problem. And I think that's the future, you know, continuing to build that technical evolution, I think, yeah. making sure that we stay abreast of it. Yeah. So are you looking to continue to grow? Are you thinking about acquiring possibly more labs in your area? Or are you guys happy where you're at? No, I think if we find the right partner for us, it's all about finding somebody that sees it the way we see it. And you know it as well as I do. One technician can look at a crown and think it's the prettiest thing ever. And another one can say, oh, that doesn't even look like a tooth. Yeah. And so finding like-minded people, like -minded people. You know, that's, that's kind of how we grow. Looking for people that say, I want to be the, the best of the best. And I don't, I don't want to sound you know, like I've got an ego here. But what we see as quality has to align with the next business partner. That, yeah, that's kind the, of where we are. And the mentality, the theory, it's, it's kind of, you know, why, like you said, Elvis, I can't believe you guys have only known each other for three years. Yeah. You could never tell. It's that kind of in-line thinking. And that's kind of what, you know, when you're looking for that, that's what you're looking mm. for. But it has to be manageable growth. Yeah. You know, I think, I think uh, one of the truths in nature is if you stop growing, you start dying. And I don't think a dental lab can ever just maintain. You have to continually press the envelope. You gotta try to be better. You gotta reinvent yourself. I mean, we've reinvented absolute three times in the last two years. Yeah. I mean, wow. we've reinvented our social media platform. Actually, we started our media platform. Yeah. But and and those are the things that's important. You know, and think about what Jack taught me was we have to be relevant in the technical world. And mm -hmm. I bet a lot of your listeners have never even heard of Absolute before this. And it's because my business partner, myself, we didn't even go to LMT because mm -hmm. we were focused on what we were doing. It's not because we thought we were better than somebody else. We didn't want to be there, but we focused on our customers. We focused on what we were doing, but that's not the right way to grow it. That's not the right way to run it either. So Jack taught us, hey, we got to be part of this community. And I'll tell yeah. you this, uh, it's been a True. blessing for us to be a part of this community. You, you meet so many great people, you yeah. know, meeting you guys, meeting yeah. Richard Cryer, meeting, I mean, it's just, you meet great people. Yeah. So our whole philosophy has kind of changed on how we run Absolute. It's been great for yeah. us, you know, been, it's been fun. You know, that's funny. We've heard from other lab owners that have been in it for years that, mm. you know, within the last five, six years, start participating in the community yeah, and they've yeah. grown and they've learned and they have people they can bounce ideas off of. And, you know, we've always said it here, you know, stronger together. Amen. And I think you start seeing your peers as peers instead of competition. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll be the first one to be vulnerable with you guys. My goal has always been go, 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 go. You know, it's much more better. Let's go for it. But now I realize there's so much to go around for all of us. You know, there's there's more work in the U.S. than we can ever. ever oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Right. So that kill, kill, kill mentality that I grew up with in South Africa, which was extremely competitive, a very small country, very small customer base. At some point, we were almost 20 technicians to every clinician. So wow. you can imagine the competition in an environment like that. And Jack taught me, you know, you don't have that year. You can be yeah. free. And you can share. And that's, I think, has been been a huge difference for Absolute over the last maybe three years. I don't even consider labs down the street competition anymore. Exactly. Amen. I'm 100% with you. Yeah. And that used to be my mentality, which, which is no longer. Yeah. You guys have mentioned social media more than a few times. What, what are the benefits that you guys have seen 
through social media? Social media, it's been huge for us. It really, really has from a lot of different levels. Social media, if you're going to put pen to paper and say, show me ROI on social media, how much Conrad and I invest in our own time and mm -hmm. doing scripts and coming up with ideas and, and documenting cases to show and things like that, it's very difficult to put a number on it. I think in the branding, the overall branding of Absolute and who Absolute is, mm -hmm. it's, it's priceless. You know, we can go, let's say, to the ACP and they come up to us and know who we are already. Yeah. yeah. That's had a lot of value. And let me just, Jack was the guy who said, you know, we got to get a social media platform. And he mentioned the word branding. And I always looked at Absolute's branding as we're doing a pretty good job. You know, we've got a nice gold badge with a tooth in it. And that was our brand. <laughs> it's on our bags. What's wrong? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you, you send out a little mailer now and then. But I think what we've established with the social media presence is, is who we want to be and who we are and or strive to be because i mean not every case is a perfect case and mm -hmm. obviously when you control your branding you're not going to show the one case with the open contact that made it <laughs> you see yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. so but we're also vulnerable i think because sometimes we'll show cases that you know these are just real life cases yeah, yeah. and we learned something i learned something i think we both learned sasha from harvest dental yeah, yeah. great great friend of ours he said to us one day Remember one thing, people want to see you hot. They want to know who you are. They just want to know about your products and all of those things. And I think, you know, Jack being a corny little character and makes everybody laugh and I can make fun of Jack and he can make fun <laughs> of me. You know, that friendship between us and the respect we have for each other has kind of come through. And I think that's resonated. You know, so I think your social media platform has to be raw. It has to be you. Yeah. But yeah. if I can give anybody some advice out there, and again, this is what Jack taught me, you control what you show. Yeah. If you take a picture, that picture is in focus. You don't put on an ugly model. You don't have a bad background. You control what you show. And those are the small things I think that really define. I don't want to give yeah. away our trade and secrets. You, <laughs> but that is, yeah, with the internet, once you put it out there, it's out there forever, uh, yeah. forever. And it's, it's like, you know, if you're putting together slides for a presentation or something, you want your your best of your best yeah. to kind of show through. And the, the social media, I mean, I could do a lecture and there could be 250 people in the room or we could do one post and it reaches 200 or it gets 250,000 views. Yeah, it's insane. Wow. It's insane. We had one post where we had 110,000 through plays on a video. Of wow. three minutes long. It's cr it's can you crazy. imagine that? That's it's, crazy. It's, it's insane numbers. Hmm. If I can give somebody advice, something I've learned from Jack and from my business partner is us as technicians get so caught up in our own little worlds. And I'm talking about myself here. Yeah. I used to be a, you know, I used to make a crown and think, oh, it's beautiful. This is a really good, good looking crown. And then my business partner, I always had a competition. We'd let our wives pick the top five crowns out of 20 every day. That's a see. dangerous <laughs> game to play, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, and let me just say, I always lost to Dries. I mean, obviously, my crowns didn't look that good. But we started Absolute, and we were sitting there. And it was just the two of us. You know, we were a six-man lab. And we thought we were pretty good. You know, we were like, yeah, we can do this. And this guy walks in one day, um, James Forgen. He works for Synergy. I'll tell you. He had flip-flops on, had an old John Deere hoodie on. And he's like, yeah, I'm a ceramist. I want to make some tea, show you what I can do. Long story, he said, where's your microscopes? Uh, We're ceramists. We don't work under microscopes. He's like, dude, I can't make a porcelain crown without a microscope. So we find a microscope in the back alley around the corner or something we threw out 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. James made a crown, a posterior crown. And Dries and myself looked at each other and we said, we suck. <laughs> I said... <laughs> Dries, is this what other people are doing and this is our quality? And we learned such a big lesson through that is, you know, step away from what your beliefs are. Same with technology. Don't let your beliefs and your attitude get in the way of actually looking at something from outside and saying, maybe I should invest in this. You know, maybe we should be better. And Drew and I owe a lot of our success to somebody like James. I mean, he taught us you are not as good as you think you are. And that's the same thing with Jack. You know, Jack came in here and he made a hybrid. And even Yan Su looked at me and said, this guy is absolutely amazing. And you can learn from people like that. 
I think as long as technicians are willing to learn, we can all be better. And that's why I'm so happy to be a part of this society, finally, of, of technis- yeah. technicians. Them as friends. Well said. Do you guys gear your social media towards other technicians? Because that's what I see because, you know, that's where I am in social media. But do you also make it geared towards dentist? I think it's more clinical, actually, to be honest okay. with you. Yeah. So we're trying to build this network around products. I see technology as a marketing tool. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the biggest marketing tool you have. Hey, I got a new product. This is what I can do. I have a new way to do an old type of prosthetics. So it's actually more geared clinical than it is technical. Yeah. It is both, obviously. But we got a customer this morning. They were on a forum and somebody said, I'm interested in digital dentures. She said, I asked the question on this forum and six dentists replied, call Absolute Dental. Nice. Wow. And I think that's the power. You know, that, that is a yeah. good. That's the difference. And it takes a while. I mean, we've been busy now for yeah. like about a year and we've a half. Been, we've been pounding away at it nonstop. And it is a lot of work. Oh, yeah. But it's part of what we believe. Mm. And, you know, it's there's so much to it. It's, you know, smart mm. from a business aspect. It's nice to do for the community, for the dental community. Mm. And, you know, there's just all these different things. And, and, you know, on top of that, we enjoy doing it. Yeah. And I will tell you, you know, I think, I think the one most valuable life lesson, I think, I learned from Jack is that ego is an absolute killer in, in almost all situations mm-hmm. in life. If you think about, yeah, you know, we were on stage one day and I, I made fun of Jack. I mean, he said something about Jack being corny and he kind of looked at me startled, you know, like we're on stage. We have to have this presence, you know, we got to be these technicians on stage, but people want to see that rawness, yeah. you know, and Jack and I will make fun of each other on stage because I think people, <laughs> people enjoy us it's being kind of the, friends. It's kind of the banter back and forth, back and forth that yeah. everybody really cracks up laughing about. And Conrad will throw slides in of me in compromising situations <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I have no, I, no idea about. And it, it really, I mean, it's really been pretty awesome. I, wow, I could, if you want to talk about real asses in the industry and egos you could delete right now for the next four hours <laughs> I, but, yeah. I won't mention any names but but it's that in that you know what we kind of grew up with that as technicians with this Big holier names. than thou ivory towers and i've been very against that i get it um yeah yeah Me too. yeah i don't believe in it it's not healthy mm. who the hell do you think you are you're a dental technician you're not Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. I don't think Mick Jagger has an ego that big. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it probably it's, does. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never believed in that. Mm. And it's just ugly. It's an ugly way to be. But if you're on stage and you're just trying to prove that you're better than everybody else, you're not sharing anything. You're not sharing. It stops the instant. The ego immediately stops the sharing and it, it immediately turns the group off it breaks the connection and it's so unfortunate. It really, really but is. But I will, I will tell you, you know, when I think in our industry going forward in the next 10 years, it's going to be very tough to reestablish those big name technicians. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, I think yeah. Because yeah, our industry came from pure artistry. Everything we did, I was a waxer finisher, of gold crowns. I loved gold crowns. I was an artist with gold crowns. We sent all our gold crowns to Arjun they get mold twice as good as I can do it in half the time. Yeah, they're beautiful. So the room for that holier and greater than thou mighty technician that owns the world is now shifting, I think, to the technician that can master technology and maintain the artistry within that media. We're not in the world where a brush rules anymore. You know, now it's a mouse. Mm. Good point. And you got to kind of figure out how to master the mouse. Mm-hmm. And the good thing for us all is this is a scalable place to be. Yeah. You know, now we can actually create a business where it used to be a mom and pop. I'm working for one or two dentists, and that's all I can do because I'm in the office all day. I've always believed you need to own who you are. You need to be proud of it. Absolute is never negotiated price. And we're not the most expensive lab in the world. We're not by any means, but we don't negotiate price because I believe if a customer asks for discount, he's telling you your quality doesn't justify your price. As long as your quality is good enough, he will be willing to pay that price. And that's one thing I learned early on. You know, I tell my sales guys, if somebody says you're too expensive, he's telling us we're not good enough. Then let's be better and let's let's earn that pricing structure. This race to the bottom 
nobody wins that race. No, you can't beat outsourcing. You can't be cheaper than somebody that pays another guy five dollars an hour. Yeah. So you, we need to be proud of who we are. We need to be proud of our artistry and of what we do. So if a doctor said, "Hey, I'd love to use you guys, but I need you to match my last lab, which was a dollar less," you wouldn't do it. No, that's it's, it's, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't do that. I, I, it's amazing. They don't keep it a secret, but what a lot of people don't know and what's remarkable about some of the things Drees and Conrad did here is really what I found different than anybody else at the time is they did not do the race to the bottom, especially when it comes to monolithic zirconia mm-hmm. posteriors. And a lot of people in our industry don't know that. And I think that's its own story to tell on how they were able to maintain that and how they did that. But mm-hmm. still today, they maintain that, and there's a, a line, a hard I mean, line we, drawn. I will say we help out the universities. Obviously, we want to support the students. Sure, clinics, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I will say if somebody comes to me tomorrow and say, you know, I got a $2 million a year contract, I'm definitely going to give him that dollar discount. Oh, sure, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I kind of say that tongue in cheek. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's important. You have to own who you are. And if you're proud of it and you say, hey, let me show you what Jack Morano will put in your patient's mouth. They see the value. They're always going to push you for a little discount to see if you're going to budge. But if you stand firm, I tell you, it's amazing. We're obviously trying not to do PFMs anymore. <laughs> me too. <laughs> if I can get rid of it completely, yeah. I would do it. Yeah. I would get it. They're almost gone. And it's almost gone. So They're think, the stragglers. Think about this. So, so we're working with one of the dental schools and obviously a lot of the faculty is a little bit older yeah and they still believe in pfms mm-hmm. so uh they call us one day and they said you know nobody can do pfms well anymore because we just don't have waxer finishes anymore we don't have the people that can spend the time they said we'll send all the pfms to you what's your price i said 350 dollars a unit nice smart man and uh, <laughs> not precious alloy but listen, but listen to what happens <laughs> I said it because I didn't want yeah. it. I know. I yeah. Want it. <laughs> yep. Let me tell you, we do more PFMs today than I will ever admit. Wow. At double the price. I mean, they're high quality. They got to be the right quality. They'll send them back in a heartbeat if they're not perfect. But there's a lesson to be learned there. You know, if you try to chase the the $90 crown or the $95 crown or the $85 yeah, crown, yeah. you're going to work day and night. You're never going to make money. And I would rather do two crowns, have a life, and make the same money as somebody that has to do 20 crowns to do the same thing. The, the thing I've learned the hard way through the last 25 years is you've got to run the numbers. You've got to make sure you make money. Yeah. We had a financial guy stop by the lab a few years ago, so maybe 10 years ago, and he said, let me do a financial analysis of your company. And I was like, ah, I don't need that. Came back with the report. He said, do you realize you lose $2.50 for every posterior PFM you send out. Oh, wow. He said, think about what I'm saying. If you make a thousand crowns, you're losing two and a half thousand dollars. Hmm. So if you cut all that business off tomorrow, you just made an extra two and a half thousand dollars. And that's very important. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta charge what your work is worth. And if your work is not worth a lot, let Jack train you. He does a lot of these trainings. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It's a lot of variables that they don't teach us at school in this industry. Yeah, they don't teach any of that in school. So appreciate you guys coming on. That was amazing. This is a blast. Yeah, loved Happy it. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Absolutely. Yep. I totally foresee a part two sometime because it sounds like you guys got a lot to share. Yeah, awesome. that'd be great. We'd love it. Well, we're honored by the invite to be on and um, happy Thanksgiving and stay safe. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Conrad, Jack, we thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. The Asiga Max, the world's most advanced lab 3D printer, offers exceptional productivity. Well over 300 labs in the U.S. can attest to its accuracy, speed, and precision. With the 62 micron print precision, The MAX is optimized for both the dental lab or the clinical environment. Its exclusive SPS Smart Positioning System technology guarantees that every single layer is formed accurately, resulting in consistent results in any environment. And its single point calibration makes calibration extremely accurate and fast. 
as an open material system, you can print any suitable resin from any material manufacturer. Your choice, no strings. The Max also features the fastest material changeover of any 3D printer. Labs love this. Change completely from one print resin to another in under 30 seconds, which is really amazing because you and I both know how hard that is. All of this and the finest, most dependable technical support staff in the dental lab industry. Call Whitmix today or visit Whitmix.com to find out more about the Asiga Max. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. I really, really enjoyed that interview. A huge thanks to Conrad and Jack for coming on the podcast. We love what you two are doing together to showcase the fun side of our industry, while at the same time expressing the importance of good quality work and creating a great customer experience. If you guys are not following those two online, look them up. They're a lot of fun. They're on Facebook, a lot of fun videos. They're pretty much everywhere. So check them out. All right, everybody. That's all we got for you. We'll talk to you next week. Happy New Year. Still? No. (laughs) Yes. Still. Still. After this week, we all need it. Yep. (laughs) Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Your choice, no springs. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs>